Okay, so let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 uh, through 5, but I, I want to get the context so that we uh, understand what Paul is saying in the context here. And this morning's message is about a faithful mom, a faithful mom. And I don't mean to uh, offend anyone that feels like they're not a faithful mom um, or thinks that they're not a faithful mom, though we know that there are people out there that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and don't have the education and understanding of what a faithful mom is, though they love their children very much. Within this context, we are talking about Christian uh, women, grandmothers and mothers and so forth, and how they're faithful to the Lord in in training and teaching their children according to, to scriptures. And by all means, we need to pray for moms uh, that need the the education and the understanding to be a good godly mother. Uh, definitely need to pray for them and, and hope that God will get a hold of their hearts and, and change their hearts, which he can do without doubt uh, as he takes hold of them, that then they will desire to be that godly grandmother or, or mother that God wants them to be. So um, we're going to focus on these two individuals and give some application as we go through this. So Paul writes this little letter here <clears throat> to Timothy while he's uh, in prison in Rome for the second time and is condemned this time and will be executed by Nero. And so this is his last letter that he writes and it is a crucial letter, and it's interesting that he writes it to Timothy. Timothy, who was not a physical son, but a spiritual son. And in no way would he ever take away uh, the blood relationship that he has, uh, Timothy, with his grandmother and mother, but, but he feels connected enough to call him son in the faith. And so a little different than the physical, but yet I think more powerful, uh, more godly in a sense, because there is a a um, unity and commitment to the gospel message and I think that's what Paul is connected to with Timothy and he sees that in him and his faithfulness because of how they brought him up. So Paul senses uh, this urgency in a sense uh, as he hears about Timothy having tears for him because of this imprisonment so he, he uh, writes this letter to encourage him to continue to be faithful to be faithful. So, but let's look at the context here just a little bit. As Paul normally does, he has his greeting in verses one and two, uh, usually with, with the, um, in this case, the grace, mercy, and peace of God in that order, not necessarily always grace first, but, but mercies and peace of God. Um, and so he greets Timothy, uh, and then he gets into his heritage in verses three through seven, his heritage with his grandmother and, and also with his mother and, and references their faithfulness, which um, is uh, the fruit of Timothy's ministry there as a young pastor uh, in a church. And then six through seven, he then exhorts Timothy to take that gift that God has given him where he has been trained by his uh, mother and, and grandmother and use it and be faithful with it. Um, don't be shy uh, because he will encounter opposition to the gospel. He will encounter hardships. He will encounter uh, relationships within the church that um, you know, are not always good. Um, and so you have to be ready for all those things and in light of all those things, still be faithful to the Lord and what God's called you to do. And that's part of ministry. So let's go ahead and, and just read verses three through five. And that's where we're gonna spend some time. And we'll, we'll look at uh, verse five and, and share a little bit about mothers. But I just, I wanna give you the context and be faithful to the text more than just come up with a, a, a Mother's Day message. Um, we're lacking that, I think, in today's uh, churches is just faithfulness to the text and what God is literally saying and not just trying to uh, maintain a power or, or create a position or place for you because you want to impress anybody because if you don't, then you will lose them, you know? And, and so people are coming to church because this guy's a great speaker. Oh, he's this guy and that guy. And they're not teaching the word. They're not sticking with the word. Now, those may read the word or a scripture, but then they go off and talk about so much other things and it's just out of context. And so they're not being faithful to, to the word itself because they want to grow or they want to maintain their their church um at this point and and going to south sudan i really don't care anymore 
Um, it's about uh, being faithful and finding faithful people um, that will be like-minded and share the gospel message uh, to a lost world. Um, the rest can go to Joel Olsteins if they want or anywhere else, you know. Um, God is raising up in these last days people that will be faithful. So let's read the, the, the verses uh, here that I'll be discussing in in First Timothy, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. And, and so Timothy, uh, after his introduction and, and words of, of grace, you know, and, and mercy and, and peace, which we all definitely need, he then says, I thank God. And he's thanking God for Timothy. You know, he, he's praising God, and his, his prayer in this sense is towards God, that God would, would find a faithful man like Timothy and, and Paul be a part of his life, and he's able to uh, pour into him that gospel message and then to see him being faithful with that message there in the church. And so he really thanks God for their relationship, which, which I think is more than just uh, uh, a mentor, but more of a, a connected spiritual um, relationship that's deep. And he sees and he hears of Timothy's tears, which tells him that it's mutual. You know, it's just not a one-sided relationship, but they both really care for one another. And especially you know, at this time of Paul's life where he's in prison, uh, and he's not fearful at all whatsoever. Uh, he's totally dependent on the Lord and whatever the Lord's will is for his life. Uh, but he wants to encourage Timothy that though I may not be here, much longer, I may be gone, may be in heaven, but uh, don't neglect to be faithful to uh, the gospel message that God has entrusted to you. Uh, you might not be able to write to me, we might not be able to correspond through other people as they come in and out of various locations, but know that that um, I'm in heaven, absent from the body, is present with the Lord, and you just be faithful, and one day we'll reunite, and we'll catch up, you know, on everything that's happening. Of course, I read that all in there, but that possibly could be the case. So he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Now, he's not talking about being pure or, or that his flesh is pure because Paul would be the first to admit that he was the chief of sinners. And if you were here during Justin's um, uh, sharing and message, he talked about the Greek word and he screamed it out pretty loud that the microphone went, Dee! you know, that Paul was saying, I am the chief of sinners. So Paul's not talking about his flesh. He's talking about, he's talking about his faithfulness to preaching the gospel message in its purity. And in his conscience, he's, he's innocent in that he gave the full counsel of God. He, he didn't add to it, didn't delete to it. He was sure and faithful to just preach what, what God had given to him and nothing else. Um, we need that more than ever before. He's a servant of God and he's passionate about what he believes in. Uh, and we do need that. Uh, we need to uh, find churches and we need to raise up people that are, that are passionate for the word of God. In other words, they love the word of God and it's powerful. They know that it's powerful. It's able to change lives and, and um, take that and just preach it and nothing else. They don't need to preach themselves. They don't need to lift themselves up. They don't need to tell a whole lot of stories and analogies, but just be faithful to the text here uh, completely. And when you're faithful to the text, it will minister because the gospel will go out uh, without void. It will accomplish what God desires it to accomplish in the life of a believer, whether it's to condemn someone or whether it's to, to uh, free someone uh, of sin. It will do what God intends it to do in their life. So Paul is saying that I preached it. In fact, in Romans 1, 9, he says, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, uh, speaking of Jesus Christ. And so with his whole heart, he preached the gospel message. And I love that about uh, the Bible from Genesis, all the revelation. There's enough material there for you to speak on for a long time. You don't need to make up stuff. You don't need to share anything else. Just stick with the text and its context and you will do fine. Now, I was blown away by the fact of just being in, in South Sudan that, um, that God really anointed uh, my time there in giving the message. It, it was kind of awe. 
because um, I spent a lot of time praying uh, because I had enough time and a lot of time sleeping too because <laughs> it's just so hot there and you're literally sweating all day long and everything's sticky. So my room had a fan in it and I went there and would sit down and read and pray and knock out. Um, it's funny because they're not lazy. You see them walking around, but it is just so hot. You can't do much. Um, so totally, yeah. Yeah, I did go to get sodas too. <laughs> there was some luxuries there. Um, so <clears throat> I was in awe because the Lord just kind of took over. I was kind of like in the zone. If you're in sports, you know, when you hit that zone and you're playing at your peak and, and all of a sudden things are just going right, it almost felt like I was standing beside myself and God was just taking over. And those three hours of teaching um, were amazing and how the Spirit was moving in, in their lives. And, and one of the, the guys came up to me and said, Pastor Reuben, uh, Philemon is my favorite book. I'm like, oh, wonderful, because I like the book too. It's one of my favorites. I, I personally like Ephesians, but uh, Philemon is a favorite book. And he goes, yeah, my favorite book. And I didn't understand what he meant. And so then I was teaching Jude, and another guy came up and says, Pastor Reuben, Jude is my favorite book. And I thought, oh, okay. And I'm like, well, what else is your favorite book? Philemon is my favorite book too. What they were saying was, you have taught it to us so well that it's become our favorite book. That's what they were saying, you know, and I didn't get it at first, and I was like, wow, and I know that it was the Spirit. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not saying that I'm a great teacher. I'm saying that the Spirit was taking the words and ministering to their, their hearts, so it was an amazing thing when you stick with the text. Just stick with the text and let the Spirit use what is written down. He will use it for His glory. So Paul here said, I serve with my whole heart preaching the gospel. So Paul served without personal motives. Uh, his conscience was clear and he was pure before God uh, completely. As my forefathers did, he said, um, not the other apostles, but, you know, the Old Testament uh, preachers uh, of old. You know, Paul's a Pharisee. He knew his stuff. He went to school. He was the best student that, that, that was ever around. And so he knew the Old Testament. Uh, he knew the Pentateuch. He knew the histories. He knew the Psalms. He knew the, the, the major and the minor prophets and so forth. And so when he said, as my forefathers, he knew. He knew as he wrote Hebrews chapter 11 possibly and he started talking about the hall of faith and, and how those men were so faithful that some were sawed in half, thrown in the lion's dens and, and, and were surrendered totally to God. So he says, I'm that committed as they were committed to. Uh, the gospel message and then he tells timothy as without ceasing i remember you in my prayers night and day prayer definitely important um here's where sometimes <clears throat> we have hypocrisy in our life because we do know that prayer is important there's power in prayer so it's how jesus said if you have faith and, and you pray you can move mountains if you go to the, the judge and you beg him enough he will he will make a decision on your behalf you go to the bread maker he'll open up the door you know prayer there's power there and of course he gave us the lord's prayer and yet we don't use it uh, we try to deal with things in the flesh in our own wisdom and, and understanding. And God is so much higher. If we were just to stop and literally pray and seek the Lord's help and strength and power, um, we would be amazed at, at what he uh, would do through us uh, for his glory. So he remembered Timothy day and night. And, and he's talking about that prayer without ceasing as the Lord brings you to remembrance. You know, I prayed for you as my spiritual son, and then he says in verse 4, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. So because of what Paul heard about Timothy, and Timothy literally having tears, uh, which is unusual for a man in this day and age, usually as a man you don't have tears. This was one of our arguments uh, with some of the staff in South Sudan, because these guys are men. These guys are men. They don't cry. Uh, cr crying is not a part of their... Uh, their um, thought process and the other guy that was with me the american he says it's okay to cry 
And, and it's okay to cry. And so he gave a couple of references of David crying and this. And I says, well, you're giving those references, but it's not saying you have to cry. It's just telling you these men cried. You know, Timothy just cried. Uh, you don't have to cry to be a Christian, and, and nor do you have to cry to be sensitive or, or show people that you're, you know, concerned or that you really do want to comfort them. You don't have to cry. That's not a scripturally, thou shall cry, you know, every so often. You know, it's not what the Bible says, you know. But Timothy cried, and uh, men do cry when they're emotionally moved in their relationships with someone. And, and this moved Timothy. I mean, he's going to miss the Apostle Paul. Yeah, I would too. You know, this guy, pretty, you know, in Timothy's eyes and in mine, I would say, Paul, you know everything. You're, you're like this close to Jesus. You know, I'd like to know a little more before you just take off. And now you're telling me that you're going to take off. And so there were tears there tears you know these men it was it was interesting um i relate to them more than than the guy that was with me he's he's actually white and and i'm brown to them which i think is a big difference um they really cater to the white americans they cater to me too but they know how valuable Americans are to them and how much they help. And so they do everything to, to invite them and keep them and keep them to come over and over again. And, and um, there was a time where I did go out and buy some soda Cokes. We, I found one of the guys had a Sprite. I'm like, where'd you get the Sprite? He goes, over there. Over where? Where did you get it? I want a Sprite. And he's like, over there. There's no more. I'm like, oh, Okay. <laughs> Because all I had was beans. All they eat is beans and rice. Beans and rice. Now, now my, my observation is limited by I was on the compound and I didn't go out, you know, to the city and so forth. I went into town, so forth. So it's very limited. I, I might not be telling you the whole truth here, but it's not on purpose. You know, it's just it was limited in where I was at. And what we ate was bean and, bean and rice. White rice and pinto beans. And, once, and they had puso. Puso, uh, if you open up the top, it looked like um, uh, mashed potatoes. But then when you touched it, it was hard like rubber. And you would cut it and you just chop it up and it was a filler for the food. And there was no taste to it at all. But it was with every meal. You just, you just had it with beans and rice. And, and beans and rice there because um, the guy who started the ministry is American. And he chops at Costco and sends everything over there in a container. And so the cheapest thing to get is beans and rice. And so that's all they eat. And, and sometimes they don't eat. Um, there was one time that um, we were waiting for, for breakfast and we waited and there was none. And so the guy says, okay, no breakfast day, get to work. And so everyone goes to work. So, but beans and rice, beans and rice. So I went into town and I was able to get a couple of Cokes. In fact, I, Michael, who's the pastor of the, of the, of the ca- um, compound and also kind of runs things, uh, I kept asking him, so you going into town today? He goes, come on, let's go. <laughs> and so we'd go and I bought a couple of Cokes. <clears throat> and I put them in their only freezer on the compound. They have no refrigeration at all. And so I put them uh, at the bottom really close where they could really get cold because everything's hot there. Everything's hot. Uh, and, and they have no running hot water. And so when we were up to eat, I forgot them. And so I said to, uh, to Mike, who's the white guy, I said, hey, Mike, can you, go, can you go get those sodas? I left them down. He goes, oh, yeah, no problem. He turns around. And one of the commandos, a sergeant major who's running the camp also with Michael said, how come you don't ask me? I'm like, uh, because I asked him. I go, he goes, you asked me. He shouldn't go. I'll go in his place. He goes, you guys are better than us. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, no, we're not better than you. If, if you want to measure us in man, I said, you're better than me. You've been in the bush, you've been in battle, you've been in fighting, they shot bullets at you, and you're going to say that I'm better than you? I don't think so, man. I mean, you are a man's man. You're out there fighting and battling for your country. You have left your, your wife at months at a time to be here to serve your country and to serve these men. I go, no, 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 you're better than me. But that's their view. That's their view of, of, of Americans and, and so forth. So... Um, the crying, there's no place for it at all. And, and so um doesn't mean we have to cry, but if God moves us like Timothy was moved here, he, he uh, cried for Paul. The, the psalmist says in 126.5, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy, with songs of joy. And, and sometimes tears 
uh, will bring fruits of joy and happiness in times. So Timothy's tears were due to Paul's arrest, imprisonment, and approaching execution, uh, effect, which affected him personally. And Paul said that, my, that I may be filled with with joy, and so he writes to him because of the tears, and it would fill his heart uh, tremendously. Let me take some time now and just look at verse five and talk briefly here about faithful mothers, as Paul just makes a reference uh, to Eunice and to Lois. He also makes a reference in the book of Acts, but that's all that we know about the grandmother and mother here, is that they were faithful to pour in faithfulness uh, to uh, Timothy, and faithfulness is, is a interesting characteristic because um, in the ministry we need men that are faithful not wishy-washy not that say one thing and do another um, we need mothers who are faithful uh, that are committed to uh, train and teach their children and, and not be um, um, preoccupied with other things in life you know in South Sudan the mothers uh, stay home with the children the men go out and work, and for months at a time, and sometimes years at a time, and they don't see uh, their family, but they uh, put their money into accounts, and they're able to s <clears throat> give to their families. Again, my, my view is limited, so this is what I saw in the compound with these military men. Some of them have not seen their wives in years, and some of them see them uh, every three months, and some of them are happy to see them every three months. <laughs> he says, in the fact, they even make a reference that, that it's, actually better you stay away and then when you come together boy you're having a good time you love each other so much because you're so grateful to see each other you know then you go away again and so forth and then some of them have 50 wives not the chaplains but south sudan uh, men 50 wives are you kidding who wants 50 wives <laughs> yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah okay i'll do it honey yes honey yes honey yeah. it's like come on I, I even uh, said, you know, I love my wife, and I, I boy, I missed her so much. Um, I said, but I can't imagine having 50 Virginias, because she loves to talk, you all know that, so I'm not, telling, <laughs> I'm not telling you anything you don't know, and nor am I, you know, bagging on her, because that's just who she loves talking, and, and she can dominate a conversation, and she uh, does, I never say a word. And so can you imagine having 50 Virginias? It's like, wow, I, I wouldn't even know the language anymore. <laughs> but they do, they have uh, that many, many wives and they stay home and they, they raise the kids and the kids are the ones that go out and, and get water and, and do, do the work for the family and wash and so forth, which amazing. And you see those little kids smile and they all have bald heads. You know, they all, and I asked, why do they all have, where, how come the girls don't have long hair? And they says, no, they need to go to school and focus. If they have hair, they're too busy and occupied with their hair. They need to learn. So they, sh they shave their heads. I said, oh, it makes sense. But you see them working and pumping water out the five gallon, you know, and they're smiling and they say hi to you. And it's like, oh, that was just oh, so good. And I was able to, um, at the end, after purchasing some things I had quite a bit of pounds left over so I broke them down and so every time I see the kids I come hi how are you what's your name and I give them you know five pounds ten pounds and they're just like thank you thank you no thank Jesus thank Jesus and then um, there was a couple of kids that I got to know and these I'm talking 13 and younger who are working to get water every day to take home and I gave a hundred pounds and a hundred pounds is not a lot to us it's about um, it's a dollar uh, of 30 pounds so 30 pounds for a dollar so what three bucks around there so it's not a whole lot but when he saw it he's like he was just like blown away didn't know what to say you know and, and, and I think he told because all of a sudden teenagers were starting to come around <laughs> and I'm like oh that's interesting I didn't I didn't give out money then because then I figured that's why they're coming so but um, there's something to be said about <clears throat> moms that are faithful so Paul said in verse 5 when I called to remembrance so this is something he knew and, and he's remembering the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and I am also persuaded is in you also and, and so this brought remembrance um, uh, Paul's remembering how faithful uh, they were so obviously he met the family and he was able to have a relationship with them and to see their faithfulness to the gospel and to train and teach Timothy to be faithful to the gospel and to be a faithful man. Um, Paul may have received news regarding Timothy um, 
tears and, and maybe really deep concern for him. And so uh, he's now thinking and dwelling upon it as he's writing this letter. And um, he mentions his grandmother first, Lois. And Lois in, in the Greek means agreeable. So you kind of get an idea that, that grandma, you know, is at a, at a place in her life where you, know, you meet her and you, she's just an agreeable person. You, you like her, you get along with her. She's not argumentative. She doesn't push her way. You know, she's just uh, very helpful, very lovable. And, and I see Virginia in, in that position. She just is always that way uh, with people. Um, she doesn't like arguments. She doesn't like to get involved with those things. You know, she has her opinions. And she she tells them to me, you know, but she always keeps them to her to herself and and so forth. So she's a, an agreeable type of person here. And Lois and Eunice were both uh, Grecians, which um, are heathen names. Timothy's mother was a Jewish, according to Luke, woman. Uh, yet she was Grecian, probably half, and probably a part of the Hellenist by by birth. Lois, the grandmother, appears to be the first one to convert over to Christianity. And she's the one that instructed her daughter and then also uh, Timothy. We don't know what happened to the father who was Greek. It doesn't say. Uh, again, could be the, the, the times too. He was out working. He was gone. We just don't know. He was dead. We don't know at all. You know, it's, fu- it's interesting because South Sudan is, is yet there's modern uh, equipment there, but yet it's so uh, dated in the early uh, or later 1800s, because uh, everything's just dirt. There's one major highway with asphalt, which is not that great. Everything else is just dirt, and everyone's walking around uh, dirty with sandals and no shoes and shirts that they've worn for weeks and weeks at a time, washing them in just water because they really don't have soap. You know, so you can imagine what their clothes look like. And those are the citizens out in the town area. Um, <clears throat> so she was faithful. Uh, to raise Timothy and, and her daughter in the faith, in the, in the gospel and preaching it, so that uh, he, at least Timothy had this basic knowledge of what Christianity was because of the grandmother there. So when he met Paul, Paul was able then to pour into him even more there in Lystra. Uh, Lois um, was a faithful grandmother. And there's something to be said about faithful grandmothers that are faithful, and I'm in the context here of the gospel and spiritual things, not in the context of, of of the world. I'm talking about faithful in spiritual things, faithful in preaching the gospel and training up a child in the way they should go, and then when they grow old, they won't depart from it. That's what I'm talking about. So that means you have to be faithful to reading and praying and studying the scriptures, and then being able to teach your children uh, that very thing. And I love the fact that my own mom is now becoming faithful, though she became a Christian later on in life, and she's a great-grandmother, but now she's being faithful to take that message and give it out to her children that aren't believers and anyone else that will listen. Sometimes it it kind of blows me away to hear her talking about the fact that she's actually preaching the gospel message now, and that's what Paul's talking about. This woman was willing to do that. And so I I wanted to look at what faithfulness means because he doesn't tell us there, right? You wish Paul would, well, tell us what it means to be a faithful grandmother. Give us some descriptions and and some thoughts there, but he doesn't. And and probably because the Holy Spirit didn't want to write it down so that you could get through the whole Bible and look at what it means to be faithful. And there's a lot of things that we need to be faithful of. So I thought last night as I was putting this together, well, let's look in Proverbs because Proverbs is a book of wisdom written by Solomon. And so uh, I looked up the word faithful there and I found quite a few of the words. We find them here in 2 Timothy, two other places, which I'll share with you in a moment. But we, we need grandmothers and mothers who are faithful. And so Proverbs thirteen seventeen says, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. And so he gives you this contrast here about a wicked messenger, you know, just brings trouble all the time. Uh, those are the gossipers, those are the trifle things, those are the, the worldly ideas and, and thoughts that are going on, where a faithful ambassador, an ambassador represents someone, and that's Jesus Christ, it's faithful, and he's going to bring health and not destruction, you know, not chaos in, in their family. And so it, it's good to be a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ. Uh, we must be that God calls us to be. Um, We need faithful uh, men and women in the church. Uh, Otherwise, things will fall apart. Things won't get done. Things won't happen. 
Proverbs 14, 5 says, a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. And so again, the contrast of a false witness who has no problem lying, making up things, uh, maybe possibly seeing things that's really not there because of whatever, you know, they're used to it. Um, used to have a boss with Southern California Edison, and he thought everybody uh, was um, out there playing around in their job, and nobody was doing their job, and it turned out that that's what he used to do, so he thought everybody else did that. You know, that was his view, and people view that because they don't really see people through the lens of the scriptures and so forth, but a faithful witness does not lie. They're they're faithful, and they're true to the gospel. They're faithful to be honest people. Uh, That's why our world is the way it is in the United States is because of faithful men and women who have raised up ministries to help people. Uh, You don't have hospitals because atheists decided let's help humanity. No, you have hospitals because Christians said let's help humanity. There are Christian hospitals and these are Christian rescue missions and these are Christian organizations that do all the services and so forth. That's how this country was founded, uh, not on uh, deceptiveness. And so being a, a faithful person to honesty. Proverbs 26, most men will proclaim each his own godness or goodness But who can find a faithful man? And I think that kind of goes along with what Paul was saying, being faithful to the gospel, pure, and his conscience was clear that he preached the gospel message. Uh, Too many people proclaim themselves, you know, are lifting themselves up and so forth. You know, God is more interested in you than he is in the ministry and even in the things that are going on around you. He wants you. He wants your heart. And so he allows things to take place in your life so that he'll make you into Uh, the image of his son. Uh, That's one thing that that I learned going to South Sudan. When we started praying about it and and thinking about the dangers and so forth, which it is dangerous, but at this time it's not as dangerous as it was in the past. Um, The focus was on myself and Virginia at the time. And as we were praying and crying and really asking God if we should go and and so forth, uh, the Lord just spoke to my heart, this is not about you. This is not about you. This is way bigger than you. It was about what he was going to do in me to change me, but also to minister to them through the Holy Spirit. And we make it about us. And boy, that's one of the biggest mistakes that we do. And that's why we have the problems we have, because we think it's about us, and it's not. God wants to use us according to his plans and purposes. In fact, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else he'll give to you. And, and we so many times think, oh, wow, then I'll get my car. Oh, wow, I'll get my house. No, no, no. He'll give you the things you need to continue to be faithful to the gospel message. That's what it is. And we miss that because we're using God like a genie in the bottle. It's my three wishes, where are they? And, and so untrue. And, and so being faithful to proclaim <clears throat> the message and not ourselves. Proverbs twenty five thirteen, like the cold of snow in time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him for he refreshes the souls of his masters. So a few words that, that I looked at and um, describe a faithful person and there are so many more as I said, I can't exhaust this in, in one sitting but I encourage you to read your word and, and look up the word faithful. Some of your Bibles may even have in the, in the back there a little word study and you can just look up faithful and what it is and and as a christian like paul he's passionate about the gospel he's passionate about his relationship uh, to god and so uh you should have a hunger and a thirst to be uh, like christ and and to change Uh, that's part of our faith and walk with jesus as uh, eunice was here too and lois the grandmother now eunice means uh good victory Uh, i like that too good victory it's a beautiful word not just victory but good victory Sometimes we think victory is, yeah, I got my enemy. I pounced on them and they got what they deserve. You know, ha ha, that's victory in the world. Well, what's good victory? You know, the spiritual victory because truly the Bible says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you and spitefully use you. Now that's good victory that you're able to reflect your savior, Jesus, who totally forgives you, forgives us, who totally gives mercy and grace. You know, that, that's our savior. She's mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 16 of Acts. It says he came to debris, that is Paul, and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewish, Jewish uh, woman and a believer, but his father was a Greek. And then that's all that we know. Uh, so Timothy 
was apparently brought up in a good home uh, as they all were coming to the Lord in a faithful home uh, completely. So we need more people like that in the church. Uh, we need people that are, that are making the choice, and it is a choice to serve the Lord and to be a, a servant in the kingdom of God. You have to choose to do that, and that means you're willing to surrender everything else and, and change a few things in your life so that you can do that to the best of your ability and, and not uh, live like the world does in gaining power and trying to maintain power and all the wealth and, and so forth in this world. That's not what life is about for the Christian person. Fame and wealth. No, it's about having and raising a good godly family and being effective in uh, the world, whether it's in your church or missions or whatever it is that you're doing, being faithful to what God has entrusted to you. Paul even said that we need to be faithful with the little things that he gives us and then he'll give us other things. And unfortunately, we, we aren't faithful with the little things, you know. He first gives us things to do and be faithful with and then he'll give us other things. But see, when a man or a person or a woman is looking for bigger things, they don't, um, they, they don't commit themselves to be faithful to the little things because they see the bigger thing coming. And then you know that they're after something else and not necessarily just being faithful to God and where he has them because they're looking for power or a position, you know, a title and so forth. And that's where they, they don't understand what it is to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And of course, Paul then moves on and says, I'm persuaded, Timothy, that this faithfulness is also in you. Um, and so I wanna stir this up in you to be uh, faithful, as he says in verse six to seven, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Timothy, you're a young pastor of the young church, and so I will be gone, and so I hope to stir up that gift that you continue to use it because the ministry at times will bring fear uh, you will be fearful, you will want to quit, you will want to give up because uh, of those that will come against you, those that will disagree with you, those that are looking for power and authority, but be faithful. Uh, don't get fearful, uh, but be faithful uh, because power and love of a sound mind. So Paul is persuaded uh, that Timothy is faithful and encourages him to continue to be faithful. Let me, let me close um, with just a few things here. Abraham Lincoln said, no man is poor who has a godly mother. And, and so if your mom's a godly mother, I mean, bless her today. Tell her you love her and encourage her. And I hope it's just not once a year, but, but do that always, uh, whenever you get a chance and encourage her because you have a good thing there. You're not poor, you are a wealthy person to have a godly mother or a godly grandmother and, and if your mother is not godly if she's not a believer then you need to pray for them you need to share and witness and maybe if you've already you know poured a lot of words into them then maybe now it's time to just live it in front of them because uh, that should be a natural as a believer we are to live what we believe and if we're not living what we believe then I don't think you're a Christian really I really don't because a believer will live it out because they truly uh, love their Lord and Savior, and they want to please Him, and so they are willing to not be of the world. And Paul said that we live in the world, but we're not of this world. And so we are not to like or love this world. In fact, John tells us in his little epistle that we are to hate the world. And, and if we love the world more than the Father, then the Father's not in us, he says. And you're on dangerous grounds in that place but pray for them because God's heart really is one of mercy and grace he never condemns you know uh, he, he's not out to do bad things to you at all he's out to restore you or bring you into a personal relationship with himself that's what he's always looking for because he loves us that much that's his very nature he is love and so pray pray for them and I know that um, if your mother was not the best mother to forgive just forgive, forget, and try to create that relationship so that hopefully they can come to the Lord and know Jesus Christ because we're talking about their eternal security. We're talking about heaven or hell. That is what's at stake here, and we play around with it as though it's not important when it is important. And so we need to forget the hurts and the pains. We need to forget those things and, and think of the bigger picture, you know, 
because that's what God does. He doesn't remember those things. He's looking to draw them out of the world.